it's time for me to get, get out of the way. And I'm going to hand over to Steve. He's no stranger to us. We've enjoyed his ministry in the past. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what God has to say to us this morning through the Word. So let's hand over to Steve. Thank you, Steve. Where do you want me to stand? You can, anywhere you like. Where, normally? I'm, you can stand anywhere you like. You can go up there. Well, I don't mind. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, you've got me for two weeks. That's uh, good. And I want to speak to you about an hour. No, not. I don't want to speak to you for an hour. Oh, I could see the relief on some faces there. I want to speak to you about an hour which Jesus talked about. And we'll spend two weeks looking at that hour. Praise God. <coughs> We're going to read a... Have you made your last will and testament? I'm not looking for business. I'm not trying to drum up business or anything like that. But Jesus made his will. And um, am I shouting, by the way? Um, Jesus made his will, his last will and testament. And he prayed a prayer. It is actually the Lord's Prayer. John chapter 17. The prayer we talk about as being the Lord's Prayer is really our prayer. But the Lord's Prayer is John chapter 17. And perhaps we can flash that up on the screen. And uh, it seems silly me reading it in one version and us reading it on the screen in another. So I wonder if I could just read it from the screen. Is that okay? After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on the earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me. For they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they, will, they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as you are one. Thank you. <clears throat> um, we never used to have these problems years ago, did we? Okay. What did we do before we had sound equipment? Thanks, Graham. I want to talk to you about an hour. Um, after Jesus had ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey, some Greeks came to him and said, Sir... We wish to see Jesus. And Jesus replied this, The hour has come. The hour has come. The hour has come that the Son of, God, of Man should be glorified. It's that hour I want to speak about. The hour that Jesus talks about. When Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the chief priests and the elders came to arrest him, Jesus said this, When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me, but this is your hour. What's all this about? But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Now, clearly, Jesus didn't mean 60 minutes. 
he was talking about an hour that would change the world forever. He was talking about an hour which had been planned in eternity before the world ever began. I think I've mentioned this before, but in the church we used to attend, where I was the pastor, my, we had Koreans with us. And um, when a Korean child is born, they're immediately one year old. I could never understand that. It seemed to me they should be nine months old. <clears throat> I could only assume they took into account the twinkle in the father's eye. That was my only explanation for it. But when a Korean child is born, he or she is already one year old because they believe that life begins at conception. But according to the Word of God, life began long before that. God said to Jeremiah, I knew you before you were formed in the womb. Now, if there's anyone here this morning that doesn't feel loved, that thinks they've been overlooked, I want to say this, God loves you. God loves you and loved you from before the foundation of the earth. Glory to his name. Hallelujah. He loves you. And he loved you in eternity. Um, he knew you in eternity. And he sent you down to earth, as it were. I sometimes like to think of it like this. Perhaps I don't remember those days somehow in eternity. And maybe when he sent me down here, he said, well, I'm going to send you down there for a bit. Uh, you won't remember any of this, but you will remember my voice. I mean, that's just a bit of poetic nonsense, I know, but forgive me. This God who loves us and cares for us, this universe has a central control. It's God sitting on his throne. Everything needs, everything needs a government, a governor. My head is governing my body, so is yours. A company needs some company directors. It needs a leadership, a government. A country needs a prime minister or a president. I'm so glad that when I get on an airplane, there's someone at the front who's in control, aren't you? There's someone there who knows how to fly the thing and take off and land. There needs to be someone in control, and God himself is in control of the world, ultimately. He sits on the throne of heaven, the majesty on high. <clears throat> He's in control. Now, there was a small planet called the Earth which didn't want that control. The scientists tell us, even those who don't know God, and according to his word, they're just foolish. There's an interdependence between all the planets and all that's going on. But there was a planet called Earth, and they didn't want to be interdependent. They wanted to be independent. And they, as we know the story in the Garden of Eden, rebelled against the rule and the authority of God. How stupid! And yet we were there. How idiotic, how foolish to turn our backs on the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And God could have destroyed us with a wave of his finger, <clears throat> but he's, he had decided to save us. You see, I want, let's just take a glimpse, if we may, into eternity. Difficult, isn't it, with these finite minds of ours? In eternity, a covenant was entered into. Not a contract, a covenant. Something, something just wonderful. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit entered into a covenant. The Bible talks about it as the eternal covenant. Let me read you just a couple of lines when Paul is writing to Titus, he says, 
eternal life which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. Wonderful. Paul says again in Ephesians that we were chosen from before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. A covenant was entered into between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This one God with three persons. The Father covenanted that he would grant forgiveness to all who came to the Son in true repentance. The Son promised that he would go down to earth and become a man and die for sinful men and women. The Father promised the Son a bride. The Son promised that he would bring many sons to glory as he brought you to glory. Are you saved? The Holy Spirit was, was promised a place in which he could live in men and women on the earth and be the reflection of the very nature of God. Hallelujah. Don't you love him? It was all planned. Knowing what you would be and what I would be and what you would do and what, what I would do, he knew it all and yet he allowed it all to happen. And um, in John chapter 12, Jesus starts to talk to himself. Do you talk to yourself? It is not the first sign of madness. <clears throat> he says this, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. There he goes again. Save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. This is the very reason I am here, to execute this hour. He's talking to himself. It's good to talk to yourself, you know, as long as you say the right things. David talked to himself. Seems he was forever talking to himself. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Try it. When you're feeling miserable and depressed and pessimistic like I am too often, try saying that to God. Lord, why is my soul disquieted in, in me? I'll trust you. It's good to talk to yourself. And Jesus talked to himself. When in John chapter 2, you remember uh, at the wedding in Cana, Mary says to Jesus, when the wine was gone, Jesus said to him, they have no more wine. He said, why involve me? My hour has not yet come. And then a bit later, Jesus says something which absolutely offended those he was speaking to. And they sought to take him, but his hour had not come. This hour planned in eternity, this hour for which Jesus was on the earth, hadn't come, but now it's come. There's something that I can't explain, and there isn't a man or woman in the world that can explain, is the intimacy that existed between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Always. It wasn't as if they just met each other. They always were in this glorious, eternal intimacy of love and eternal fellowship. And during that hour, that fellowship would be broken. You understand that, don't you? We'll deal with that a bit more next week. It wasn't the physical suffering of the cross that was the issue, terrible as that were, was. In fact, a new word had to be coined to explain it, excruciating of the cross. It was a terrible thing, but there was something much more terrible than that that was going to happen, the Son would lose that eternal fellowship with the Father. This hour, this hour, this hour. You, you remember Isaiah chapter 6 when he sees the Lord high and lifted up? And there's something he sees there that's wonderful. He sees this intimacy. He sees the seraphim flying round 
with the wings covering their eyes and their feet and flying, and they're crying. What are they crying? Holy, holy, holy. There's something there. There's something that Isaiah saw. Oh, sometimes I wish I could see it like that. There was something about, about that he saw that, of this intimacy, this, this great togetherness of God. And then those of you who are familiar with Proverbs chapter 8, you read, you read that, that, that chapter, it's all about wisdom. It's talking about wisdom, 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 wisdom. And then it's almost as if wisdom talks. In verse 12, it says this, I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Jesus is talking, wisdom is talking, and he says, I was daily his delight. There was a delight and an intimacy and a wonderful fellowship that this hour was going to break. And now Jesus is coming to this hour. I wonder if some of you will be familiar with the covenanters of the 17th century. There's a lovely story of a, a young girl. In those days, it was it the Stuarts. The king was the head of the church. He had a divine right. And the Scottish Presbyterians would have none of that. So they had to meet in secret. And there was a young girl, there was a young girl going to communion. And um, she was stopped by a soldier. Now, if you were found with a Bible or going to religious service that wasn't part of the state system, you were in trouble. And they stopped this young girl, the soldiers, and this is what she said to them. My elder brother has died, and they're going to read his will this afternoon. He has done something for me, and he has left something for me, and I want to hear them read the will. <laughs> That's clever stuff. That must, have, that must have been God inspired in that young, young woman. God's left a will. Understand that. I was a solicitor for many years. Made lots of wills. Saw people fall out over lots of things. But before a will is effective, some people used to, sometimes people would say, look, I've made my will, I can't spend that money. They used to say, oh no, you spend it. Because a will doesn't speak until someone dies. Jesus died. And what we've just read is his will. He says, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. I have glorified your name. I've declared to them your name. I've declared your name. I've glorified you, Lord. I've glorified you, Father. My name is Stephen. <clears throat> it's got a Greek origin. And it means, I'm not sure what it means, garland, I think. <clears throat> but the names of God are not mere names. They're a description of his character. And Jesus came and he said, I've told them what you're like. I've shown them what you've li you're like. I've glorified your name. I've revealed them to you. I've revealed you to them. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? He said, was it to Philip? He said, Philip, you've seen me. You've seen the Father. I've glorified your name. He says, I've done it. I've finished the work that you gave me to do. I've shown men and women what you're like. Hallelujah. That's what he did. He who has seen the Father has seen me. Now, says the Scriptures, you are to glorify him too. That's what Paul says. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God. Make him known in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now this is our function. To make him known. To declare in our lives the character of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen. And I'm finishing. Don't worry, I won't speak for an hour, I promise. If you're going to do this, 
you've got to have eternal life. If you're going to declare the life of God, you've got to have that life. Isn't that right? Well, if you're going to live the life, you've got to have the life. And what did Jesus say? And this is eternal life, that you go to heaven? No. That you live forever? No. You understand this eternal life has got nothing to do with duration, nor has it anything to do with geography. Some of you are looking as if I've gone mad now. I'm only quoting the words of Jesus. And this is eternal life. What? That they may know me. You see, you can't have this life without knowing him. It's not a matter of believing a few facts. That Jesus died and he rose. Well, the devil believes all that. It's more than that. It's receiving him who is the life. And the only way you can receive him who is the life is by the Spirit of God coming to you and convincing you that you are wicked beyond imagination, that your heart is filthy and awful and dreadful, and when God has done that in you by His Spirit and convinced you that your heart is deceitful and desperately wicked and even you don't know how bad it is, then you come to Him and you say, Lord, you've convinced me. I agree with you. I agree with you. I am a sinner and I need a Savior. And I'm coming to you. And I'm turning from my sin. I'm changing my mind. I'm changing my direction. Then he comes to you. And you receive life. And you'll have to keep receiving that life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever keeps on believing, keeps on receiving eternal life. I'll finish with a story. It's a true story. I wrote a little poem about it. I'll read you the poem and then we'll finish. I don't know whether I've told it here before, but I'm really good at repeating myself. <coughs> it's about a Scottish minister, minister in the 19th century, and he stopped off at an inn one night. And there was a, I suppose you'd call her a chambermaid. She was in an awful state. And he says, here's what I want you to do. Ask God to show you how bad your heart is. And then I'll come back again. A strange thing to say. She did that. He came back a few weeks later. And the landlord said, I don't know what you said to her, but she's been hopeless and useless to me. She's wept and wept and wept. Oh, good, he said. I'll see her again now. He said, now here's what I want you to do. I want you now to pray again and say, Lord, show me the glory of your heart. She did. He met her later. She said, I did what you said. And God revealed himself to me. And now I'm saved. You must forgive me. I don't like the sinner's prayer. It's all right. If people say genuine things, but I guess it's become a bit of a formula. So I wrote a little poem about it. I've called it All You Need to Say. All you need to do, all you need to say, all you need for life is just the sinner's prayer away. What is this sinner's prayer we hear so much about? Said as if a formula to avoid all doubt. Let me quote you from a book. You'll have to guess what book this is. It's not the Bible. Let me quote you from a book. Copies, millions sold. The formula repeated for entrance to the fold. First, believe God loves you and you he will forgive. Receive him as your savior and you will surely live. Is this the real gospel or really just a sham, a mockery? some easy grace who's here as it will damn. No word about God's wrath. 
a word about repentance or turning from our anarchy and crimes to gain the entrance. Let me suggest a prayer. You see, I've pinched this now. Let me suggest a prayer. It is in two brief parts. First, show me, Lord, as you desire, the horror of my heart. Here then is the second when the first part is done. Now show me, Lord, as you desire, the glory of your Son. Is any here that don't know God this morning? That's just my simple suggestion. Ask God to show you the horror of your heart. You'll be surprised. When he's shown, him, shown you the horror of your heart, you'll hate it. I hate my whole heart. I'm glad he's given me a new one. Sometimes it rears its ugly head. <laughs> and then when he's done that, say, now, Lord, show me your heart, the glory of your heart. And then give me a new heart, a heart like yours. Amen. It's brave. Father, thank you for your kindness for this hour, Lord. This hour we've been looking at this morning, just before you went to the cross and completed it all and cried out, it's finished. We're so glad it's finished, Lord. Speak to every person here this morning. Speak to us all, Lord, that we might be a pleasure to you and walk according to how Jesus walked on the earth, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.